Adam Powell is a junior research fellow in the Department of Theology and Religion at Durham University in the UK, where he was the recipient of the Durham International Fellowships for Research and Enterprise. He's published on topics ranging from patri patristic theology to the history of sociology and from Mormonism to identity theory. He's the author of the book, Irenaeus, Joseph Smith, and God-Making Heresy, published with Farley Dickinson University Press. And his presentation today will draw on some of that research. So would you join with me in welcoming uh, Dr. Powell today here with us to BYU? Thank you. Yeah, it's um, an honor. I'm aware of the time constraint now. Um, yeah, the, so it's, it's a real privilege, honestly, to be here at BYU. This is my first time in Provo. Um, and last night was my first time at In-N-Out Burger. So this is really a big week. You know? um, I grew up on the East Coast, so we don't have such things. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, as Spencer mentioned, uh, my talk today, which I'm going to try to blow through quickly now, um, is based on this book that he mentioned. Um, and of course, I'll be more than happy to talk afterwards about the book. Um, but it's, this is kind of, uh, you know, it's something that's like 45, 50 minutes. You've got kind of two choices. You can kind of go really, really in-depth about one small little thing, or you can kind of give a general argument. Um, and so I've done the latter. Um, so what I want to start with is a question, a rhetorical question, you don't, don't have to answer, about this diagram, okay, the plan of salvation. <clears throat> Does this diagram represent thoughts, beliefs, or experiences? In other words, if you had to choose one of those, could you? Now, I'm going to argue, as someone involved in interdisciplinary kind of research on religion, that you cannot separate the three, okay? Thoughts, beliefs, and experiences. Specifically, it's my understanding, and this is crucial to the kind of theoretical, philosophical foundation of my work, um, that, that this is, in the lived kind of lived reality, I would call it, of religion, thoughts, beliefs, and experiences are intertwined and sort of involved in a kind of symbiotic relationship with one another. Now, if this was a room filled with theologians, perhaps it is, I, I guess I wouldn't really know. Um, you know, we could talk about something like, like the Trinity, the traditional doctrine of the Trinity and perichoresis and the way these three persons create uh, one essence. Or if it was psychologists, we could talk about something like gestalt theory, you know, the, the thoughts, beliefs, and experiences are coming together and they're kind of, the whole is more than the sum of their parts or something. But I thought for a kind of mixed audience that we would talk about teamwork, okay? So the way that thoughts, beliefs, and experiences, oh, I said, actually, I said teamwork. Um, <clears throat> there, okay, that's, that's better. At least I left Hayward off, right? Um, <clears throat> so the way that, that thoughts, beliefs, and experiences sort of operate in, in conjunction with one another, they each have their own sort of skill sets, their own kind of role on the court, so to speak, but they come together in, in the, the sort of lived reality of religion. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me. So this, I put this first because, like I say, it's, it's kind of the philosophical or theoretical foundation of my work, particularly from a kind of epistemological perspective that we'll see in a minute. And the reason I put it first is not only so you get to see the spurs, but, but because I want to work kind of from the most abstract and theoretical to the concrete, okay, over the course of the next 40 minutes or so. Um, <clears throat> with that in mind, then, oh, that's, that didn't work. Um, I guess uh, that's not compatible. So it's supposed to be white text, and you cannot see that. Um, so what I'll tell you is on this slide um, are the two kind of theoretical pillars uh, of the presentation. One is what's called the sociology of knowledge, okay? So this is typically traced back to this early 20th century sociologist named Carl Mannheim. But the point is, and, and this is up there, believe it or not, um, is his quote uh, that he says that the sociology of knowledge 
seeks to obtain systematic comprehension of the relationship between social existence and thought. Okay, so this relationship between social existence and thought. So that's kind of on the one hand, informing my work. And then on the other side is very important, which is identity theory. Um, I've been involved in, in different approaches to identity theory, but the one that I want to emphasize today is the work of a sociologist named Hans Moll, M-O-L, who was working 1960s, 1970s. Um, but what matters about his identity theory is essentially that he defines identity as this stable niche. Okay, he says it's a stable niche which, which individuals occupy, which they're prepared vigorously to defend. Okay, and then he goes on and he kind of places that into a working definition of religion. So he says then religion is the sacralization of that identity. Okay. And so he kind of has this kind of building block uh, theory where he then says in sacralization is kind of rituals and myths and, and commitments that are all there to, to kind of give a, a sacred cloak around your identity. Um, but then what's even more important, particularly uh, when I get to the to kind of the concluding thoughts, is that he says, but identity is in a dialectical relationship okay, with adaptability. So he says in a way, Yes, identity is a sense of stability, but that sense of stability can only remain so as long as you're to some degree flexible and adaptable to outside forces. So those are kind of the two theoretical frameworks that I'm working with. Um, now all of this is kind of, I think falls into the category of what we would call meaning making in the, the kind of humanities and social sciences, right? The, the idea that People are involved in this incessant kind of drive to make sense of and from their experience. <clears throat> oh. This is unfortunate. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so this slide has a Latin phrase on it, ordo ab cal, okay? And this is order from chaos, is what it means. And I thought I would include it not only because over the course of the presentation, that's sort of what we're talking about, how you make order out of chaos, okay? But also because it's actually the motto of 1802 Freemasons in, in Charleston, South Carolina. And I thought, you can't talk about Mormon history without mentioning Freemasons, right? Um, no one's tired of hearing that. And <clears throat> so we could alter that then, that expression, order from chaos, uh, to, to a different one that I'm assuming you're not going to be able to see, <coughs> which is salus e adversatio, which is salvation from opposition. Okay, so again, working toward the concrete here. So not just talking about some vague notion of order out of chaos. I'm really talking about how you get to some notion of salvation out of experiences of opposition. Okay. So the, the specific focus is the relationship then of a particular type of experience that I'm going to call opposition to a particular type of thought and belief, which is, the, is salvation or even more specifically the Mormon plan of salvation. So in the following I'll suggest the opposition faced by early Mormons, I'm defining early Mormons as Joseph Smith's tenure essentially is uh, related in interesting ways to the contemporaneous development of their notion of salvation, that I'm going to call the plan of salvation, as well as to subsequent, the, the subsequent success or longevity of Mormonism. So that'll be kind of my concluding topic. Okay, so let me, let me read some words here. Let us go. Let us go from a country of strife, from a land where the wicked are seeking our life. From a country where justice no longer remains, from which virtue is fled, where iniquity reigns. Let us go, let us go where our rights are secure, where the waters are clear and the atmosphere pure, where the hand of oppression has never been felt, where the blood of the prophets has never been spilt. Let us go where the kingdom of God will be seen in its order, extending abroad where the priesthood again will exhibit its worth in the regeneration of man and of the earth, let us go. Let us go to the far western shore where the bloodthirsty Christians will hunt us no more. 
where the waves of the ocean will echo the sound and the shout of salvation extend the world round. No, those are the words of Eliza Snow. And as she's looking for salvation, for justice, for the end of oppression and the order of God's kingdom. So keep those themes in mind. Now, for the less romantically inclined among us, we could quote something like Max Weber, one of the fathers of sociologists. He said, since every need for salvation is an expression of some distress, social or economic oppression is a natural source of the need for salvation. Thus, I want to argue that moments of confusion or crisis or conflict unlock the power of religion to explain or frame the inexplicable. This assertion is not, by the way, about the, the human capacity for belief, which I take to be a, a kind of cognitive um, or psychological topic, um, but it's about the socio-cultural flavor of the beliefs as they're kind of operating at this, this nexus of, of social life and identity. Okay. So what was the nature of early Mormon social life? <clears throat> I'll read uh, <clears throat> what that nature was. Uh, so <clears throat> what the title of this slide is Contextual Crises. Okay. So I wanted to just give a, a very, very quick kind of snapshot. Much has been written about this, but of kind of what are, what's the sort of zeitgeist of, of early 19th century America. And so what I had listed is just literally different types of movements and ideas like revolution, republicanism, democracy, disestablishmentarianism, anti-authoritarianism, increased pluralism, emerging civil religion, the Second Great Awakening, frontier justice or vigilantism, enlightenment rationalism, empiricism, let us go, let us go from a country of strife. As I put it in, in the book that, that was mentioned, the sails were swollen, but there was no one at the helm. And I probably should have added, because everyone was at the helm, okay, this time. And the reason that this matters is because I think these were sort of heady times for America. Um, but these kind of prevailing philosophies were such that there was a lack of common identity or a shared history or a notion of shared tradition. In some ways, the value, and, and, and perhaps some things haven't changed, uh, in some ways the value was on new rather than old. Okay? And um, we could talk more about that. Um, but I'll move on to, so that was sort of just basic, the, the basic context of what we're talking about. Early Mormonism is emerging in that scene, okay, where there, I'm arguing there was a lack of shared identity, a common history. Um, <clears throat> uh, but there's also the overt opposition directed at or against Mormons. So let's, let's talk about those for a minute. Um, I break these down uh, here and in the book into three kind of types of opposition. So the societal, the doctrinal, and then the personal slash physical, okay? So the overt opposition. So we'll start with the societal opposition. Um, so I think there were, there were two main bullet points there. Um, one is, what I'm just saying is name calling, okay, name calling. Uh, and then the other is social subversion, or the perception of social subversion, okay. So what do I mean by name calling? Well, much of the opposition against early Mormonism was transmitted in written word. It seems that nearly everyone had their own printing press and was prepared to use it. So there were diatribes, polemical kind of pamphlets, um, these were abundant. And this also played a significant role then, in, as we'll see in a minute, in doctrinal opposition. But much of the textual attacks took the form of just name calling. Um, and so, it, I mean, if you wanted all sorts of examples of this, actually Spencer's book is a, is a great resource on that. So this kind of anti-Mormon rhetoric. So just to, to list a few sort of names 
that were thrown out there about Mormons themselves or about the movement, you had things like dupes, imposters, delusional, a superstition, magic, folk magic, infidels, and bigots. This form of opposition was less, though, about correcting perceived theological aberrations and more about robbing Mormons of sociocultural legitimacy or authority. Uh, and this is something that, in fact, uh, if you look at the early stages of nearly every new religious movement, uh, this is actually quite common. And so in the book, I actually compare this to what's happening with early Christians um, in the, the early you know, years of the common era. Um, and so you have the same kind of thing, wanting to call them something other than a religion, or a, you know, certainly in this case of Mormonism, something other than just Orthodox Christianity, because you want to rob them of legitimacy because they're a social competitor. Now, of course, name-calling was also at times combined with accusations of social or cultural subversion. Okay, so this is the accus accusation of social subversion, which is the second point. Um, so you have something like the politician William Penniston, who calls the early Mormons thieves, liars, counterfeiters, and of course, dupes. Um, but the idea was that Mormons represented more than a group of kind of just credulous kind of simpletons or something. They represented a viable threat to social norms, perhaps even to law and order. This was the perception. The, uh, was reinforced then, of course, when there was things like the on block voting in Missouri organized by Mormons. And these kind of things reinforced the notion uh, that this group was there to subvert norms, perhaps to, to be a threat to democracy itself in that case. Um, and of course, you have to remember that, that most of this is happening with some notion also that Mormons, particularly when they're in Missouri and, and these, these heightened conflicts are happening, that Mormons are transplants, right? So even in the, just kind of the geographical sense, they are outsiders in a, in a sort of literal, physical sense. Um, and so what's interesting, though, as, as you'll see, is that Mormons arrive in Missouri and Illinois, and they are outsiders, but they increasingly welcome that label, okay? And then non-Mormons kind of respond accordingly. So this is the kind of in-group, out-group kind of conflict. Now, by 1842, this all led one ex-Mormon, John Bennett, to accuse the group of, and I quote, infidelity, deism, atheism, lying, deception, blasphemy, debauchery, lasciviousness, bestiality, madness, fraud, plunder, larceny, burglary, robbery, perjury, fornication, adultery, rape, incest, arson, treason, and murder. Serious crimes indeed. Now, it doesn't matter for our purposes whether there's any factual truth to any of those claims. What's important to note is that that list, if true, points to behaviors and choices that would represent the height of incivility and disorder. Okay? From a country where justice no longer remains, from which virtue has fled, where iniquity reigns. Now, as this boundary between in-group and out-group solidified, Mormon exclusivity was interpreted within the community, within the Mormon community, as divine chosenness, okay? So uniqueness in society is, is pretty quickly interpreted as uniqueness in God's plan. So this brings me then to doc, doctrinal, um, I've been working in the UK for a few years, or you could say doctrinal if you'd like, um, opposition, because, of course, the religious claims and teachings of early Mormonism were, as one may expect, opposed by religious competitors. Um, so in the, in the doctrinal opposition, what I have up there is, is three, ex three examples, so I'll just I'll list what they are. So these are exposés, okay, is what I chose to highlight. Now, all of this I've just chosen a, f a handful of examples. I mean, you could go on all day. Um, so I have, as you sort of have to do, I have Alexander Campbell and his, his attack on the Book of Mormon itself. Um, most of you will be familiar with that. 
Um, so, you know, he kind of attacks the way in which the Book of Mormon sort of all too conveniently resolves all the theological debates raging at the time and says, therefore, it must be fraudulent. Um, the other two I list are Truman Coe, who's a Presbyterian minister, um, and he, he's, he kind, of, kind of gives a more ironic um, expose, sort of, so he, he reveals some of the teachings, what he believes are the teachings of Mormons, and says that those are false teachings, even if the members are industrious, sincere, and good neighbors. So he kind of tries to be a bit more balanced. And then you have Richard Livesey, who's a Methodist minister, who took issue with the claims and use of divine revelation, and ends up saying, quote, they lie by revelation, swindle by revelation, cheat and defraud by revelation, run away by revelation, and if they do not mend their ways, I fear they will at last be damned by revelation. Now, of course, religious competitors opposed Mormonism in, in more physical ways as well. Um, so that takes me to the, the sort of personal physical opposition. Now, by personal physical, by the way, I mean literally attacks on the physical well-being of Mormons, but also kind of efforts to thwart the, the, the physical um, in enterprises and endeavors of Mormonism. Um, so with that in mind, you could note something like that it's a group of ministers uh, who in New York destroy a, a dam that has been built by the Mormons and is being used for baptisms. Um, likewise, it was another Presbyterian minister, Finnis Ewing, who told Missourians in 1833 that Mormons were, quote, the common enemies of mankind and ought to be destroyed. Uh, strong words from a, a religious competitor. Um, and there are all sorts of examples, of course. Um, but I want to look at then two kind of categories of the personal physical opposition. Um, okay. <clears throat> so the two categories are one, collective violence, and then the second one, and this is one I highlight in the book quite a bit, is the actual experiences of Joseph Smith himself. So typically as recounted by him. Um, so with collective violence, what I really mean is are literal physical attacks, violent crimes, et cetera. So you would look at something like Missouri Wars. Um, so Hans Mill, you have the kind of violence around the voting polls um, and this sort of thing. And, and I won't go rehash all of that. There are all sorts of fantastic books on that kind of thing. Um, but what is interesting to me as someone who's kind of a little more attuned to the social dynamics that are happening is not so much the violent crimes themselves, though, although those are absolutely some of them more atrocious, and on both sides there was loss of life and things, and so I'm not, I'm not diminishing that. Um, but what stood out to me is the injustice, okay? So while both sides, Mormon and non-Mormon in Missouri, were guilty of these sorts of things. Um, I think that, that can be said. Um, it is interesting that Mormons were repeatedly denied justice. Okay, so, I mean, what do I mean? Well, there's obviously the attempts to, for redress from the federal government that are ignored, um, but there's also just the, note, the, the, the fact that Mormons are arrested and, and, and convicted of these crimes while those who on the other side are doing the, much the same thing, sometimes worse, are acquitted um, across the board and, and don't have any kind of punishment for what they're doing to the Mormons. So there's this kind of injustice. I, that's a theme, that, again, that's in, the, in the, the poem I read and is something that, that I want you to keep in mind. Let us go, let us go where our rights are secure. Right? So then you have Joseph Smith's experiences. Of course, he famously said, opposition and persecution arose against me almost in my infancy. Um, I think that's a, a fascinating statement um, to try to unpack. Um, I, I think it's on this that I, that I have a few examples. <clears throat> I think you could take Joseph Smith's experiences of opposition all the way back to his leg surgery when he's six years old. Uh, by all accounts, a horrific event that takes him three years to recover from. Um, now remember, I am absolutely one who's going to say that religion, kind of the power of religion is unlocked in those moments of trauma or crisis or trying to understand the inexplicable. 
Um, you could list something like his brother Alvin's death, which I think um, is, is, has a major impact on the family and on Joseph himself. And then you could fast forward to something like being dragged out of his house and tarred and feathered. Surely that has an impact on him. Um, and there are, of course, just so many other examples. Now, after all of that, okay, and during all of that, one question that comes to my mind is how did Smith come to say just weeks before his death I should be like a fish out of water if I were out of persecutions. The Lord has constituted me so curiously that I glory in persecution. Let us go. Let us go where the kingdom of God will be seen in its order, where the bloodthirsty Christians will hunt us no more. Now in 1842, Shortly after Smith is accused of conspiring to, to murder the ex-governor of Missouri, the New York Herald published these words. We advise Joe Smith to be quiet. His enemies and slanderers will make him a better prophet than he could hope to be made by any other process. Opposition was the making of Moses, of Muhammad, of Napoleon, of every great master spirit that has appeared in this dirty world below. Now, not only did opposition make a prophet, I would like to argue it made a soteriology, a belief about salvation, okay? <clears throat> so we'll bring up the plan of salvation again. Um, so I wanna talk about then, I've laid out kind of very quickly and briefly, uh, these forms of opposition. I've laid out sort of my underlying theoretical framework. So I wanna talk about then how there's the, the resolution of opposition in the plan of salvation, okay? So historian David Berger asserts that for early Mormonism, quote, important doctrines developed when outside forces and movements focused Smith's attention on a problem in a particular way. I absolutely concur. Now recall Hans Moll's identity theory, this kind of Two aspects, identity, again, is related to stability and order, steadiness, this kind of thing. And adaptability is related to forced changes, external forces working on you, okay? Therefore, we may expect to find external pressure interacting with attempts to confer and to maintain an orderly sense of identity and meaning for these early Mormons. Now, this certainly appears to be the case with regards to the external forces we've just seen. In fact, if we were to look specifically at the opposition faced by Mormons in Missouri, first around 1833 and then again in 1838, we would see a correlation with Smith's revelations. 1833 revelations highlighted the notion of future rewards for those who keep God's commandments highlighted that obedience is an issue of human agency, that, God's, uh, that God is encouraging Mormons to seek peace with their enemies, that there will be rewards for those who endure persecution, and that persecution is divinely sanctioned. Of course, the plan of salvation as we now know it begins to take shape in Smith's letters from Liberty Jail in 1839, which mentioned the possibility of many gods. It mentions the pre-mortal council in relation to a hoped for future, the condemnation of opponents, and the salutary opportunity extended to the righteous in the form of persecution. So indeed, the plan of salvation, which I take to be a kind of meta-narrative or, or salvation scheme, was born out of this blend of thoughts and experiences, persecution, agency, obedience, justice, and a cosmic plan. Drawing on the books of Moses and Abraham, the revelations I just mentioned, something like the King Follett discourse given just before Smith's death, this plan of salvation married moral pragmatism to a sense of the eternal. It was a scheme that was capacious enough to incorporate past, 
present, and future in such a way that suffering, loss of agency, and just rewards found a place and a purpose of cosmic significance. So over time, the salvation scheme claimed that the spiritual was material, that God has a physical, human-like body, and that ultimate rewards awaited those who both suffered and who gained sacred knowledge through the ritualized commitments available in the temple. <clears throat> so unfortunate. Um, so what I began to realize then, <clears throat> what this has on it is uh, I have past, present, and future for the three bullet points. And I talk about, and I show here, and it's actually not in my notes, but the different aspects of the, the plan of salvation that relate to past, present, and future. And there's some overlap, of course. There are aspects that relate to both. Um, a, a perfect example would be something like uh, baptism for the dead uh, that reaches back into the past, absolutely is something performed in the present, and has implications for the future. Um, so that would be one example of many that are there in black print. Um, so what I began to realize in my research was that the introduction of temple rituals, including baptism for the dead, revelations on marriage, and thoughts on deification, or we may prefer eternal progression, joined the past to the future through actions and obedience in the present. Or in kind of theological terms, you could say something like creation was joined to redemption through participation. More importantly, this resolved specific forms of opposition by providing an identity in integrating the antagonism experienced by early Mormons. <clears throat> so this is where that, that kind of, the, the, the particular form of resolution I've included here. Um, so if we think back then to something like when I was kind of laying out, you know, that this time period and this context is lacking a sense of shared history or common identity. Well, the plan of salvation, again, I'm using it as this kind of large umbrella term, okay, for, for beliefs about salvation, but also for things like ritual participation in the temple and these kinds of things. This gives an instant history, um, which has been noted by a few others, um, that this is a kind of, you know, you have something like patriarchal blessings or something that gives you literally a lineage, right? And, and so there's an instant identity, and that identity is tied to history. Um, and of course, I mean, you can't overlook the fact that the Book of Mormon does that um, really, really quite well is also. So from the beginning, there is a notion um, of trying to tie the community to history, but I think that notion takes more and more of a kind of crystallized form over those, those first 14 years or so. Um, so you have a rich instant history, um, Something about in the present, you have this kind of shared mission and identity. Obviously, there's been a great deal of talk about you know gathering of Zion as a kind of shared mission. Um, but but God's chosen people, who were being you know highlighted as unique by outsiders, begin to be highlighted as unique by insiders and having this unique role in God's plan in the here and now. Okay. But also notions of, you know, enduring persecution gives you a purpose in the here and now. Um, and even ideas like, like eternal progression, uh, though it comes, you know, late uh, in, in Smith's time, it still, it, it gives you a sense that, and I think this is often misunderstood uh, among any group that has a kind of notion of deification, it's actually typically less about the future and more about the present. So it's not so much, oh, I just can't wait to be my own God, right? It's certainly more about kind of moral pragmatism and endurance and the use of agency in the present. Um, and then in the future, I uh, just include there, collective and individual, um, uh, interminable kind of goal, right? So progression goes into the future. That's dependent on exercises of agency, 
um, and has to do with the conquest of death. So the conquest of death, kind of a, a social science-y, jargony term, um, but just this idea that this, a lot of this has to do with overcoming death and overcoming persecution, um, and it emerges at a time when they're facing death and persecution. Um, so for this opposed community then, spirit was matter, and God was a man progressed, because this made mortality as materiality central to the incessant progression and salvation of the sufferers. The future was bright and eagerly awaited, not because it provided respite, but because it brought just uh, recompense for mortal experience. Salvation was not hypothetical hope, but embodied actuality. And the shout of salvation extend the world around. Um, now, well, at least the book cover showed up, right? Um, <clears throat> so, in a sense, then, Mormon, I'm arguing, came to be a sort of motivated, active identity which successfully incorporated opposition, okay? Thus, a question that was raised in my mind as I was doing this, this research was how, if in any way, Maul's dialectic between identity and adaptability, which I think absolutely helped make sense of this particular historical case, how might that relate to um, kind of this discussions in social sciences and in history about the success of a new religious movement. Okay, so um, you have something like the anthropo anthropologist uh, Mark Leone, who has said specifically of Mormonism that Mormonism became a very flexible faith because its doctrine of deification originated in circumstances that were flexible, changeable, and often fragile. Okay, um, and <clears throat> You also may be familiar, so the sociologist Rodney Stark, who did write a book on Mormonism and is actually well known for kind of his projection into the future that Mormonism would be the next world religion. Um, and we can leave that to later. But he, he has said that new religious movements succeed, and he lists, I think, 10, 10 things that need to be kind of in order for a new religious movement to succeed. One of those, though, is, and it, he leaves it somewhat vague, is he says they need to maintain a medium level of tension with their environment, okay, a medium level of tension. So this is the kind of thing that was in the back of my mind as I was doing this research, and it struck me that perhaps, um, I mean, we can, I, I think I know what he means by that medium level of tension, but it struck me that perhaps the tension necessary for success is the tension between order and chaos, in a way. Uh, so I think Maul was correct on this, but Maul doesn't go into this very much in his own work. But, it's, but this idea that, uh, as the, the quote from Mark Leone puts it, that these beliefs, this plan of salvation, emerges in a situation that is ex itself changeable and fragile and fluid, and, um, and it incorporates the opposition that they're facing. And that I think that has implications for the future then. If, you, if you're essentially kind of crystallizing a, a overarching kind of meta-narrative in the face of opposition, then it's quite possible that that is a particularly inherently now flexible belief system that will abet kind of maintaining stable identity in the future when something else emerges that challenges it. Um, so what I call that in this book is, which you can see, the, uh, is ela elasticity, okay, is the term I, I use to capture this kind of flexible, flexible kind of ability to, to maintain something called a cohesive identity, uh, but also incorporate changes and adapt when necessary. But also, and if, I think actually the, the image of a rubber band is, actually fits exactly what I mean, because, because also it can be stretched too far. It can, it can break. 
Um, and I agree with Maul and, and his assessment that on the other side, it can be too rigid. Um, so both, so it's, it, that is what I take to be the medium level of tension, actually, is this ability to kind of maintain a cohesive identity, but also adapt when necessary. Um, now that concept that I'm calling elasticity is, is related to a number of others um, that I won't go into, but, but I'm certainly far from the only one to have <laughs> this kind of idea. I just think elasticity is a nice term to kind of capture the idea. Um, but I also think it's useful because it allows us to study religious traditions at both the largest scale of meaning systems, so something like my use of it in the plan of salvation is this kind of umbrella idea, as well as small scale individual elements of a religion. Um, so something like uh, this would fit well with something like the Book of Mormon versus Doctrine and Covenants. The one is kind of this closed, rigid canon, and the other is at least theoretically open, an open kind of sacred text. So, and if you look at them, you know, one is giving a kind of narrative history, and one is absolutely addressing pragmatic uh, issues. There's really nothing more adaptable than that. Um, it's it's yeah, beautifully conceived in that way. Um, so ultimately applying then elasticity to the entire scheme or to one of its components is possible, I think, precisely because thoughts, beliefs, and experiences are interrelated and mutually influential on one another. Uh, so in other words, because thoughts, beliefs, and experiences work together or in this kind of symbiotic relationship, it sort of doesn't matter which level, kind of meta level or micro level, you're, you're looking at lived reality in, in a religion, this idea of elasticity applies at, at any of those levels. Um, now, this was true in Mormonism's nascent stages, but it's also true across time. The flexible identity forged in the fires of early Mormon experience is the same salient identity lived out in BYU today. Indeed, it's the latter, I'm arguing, because it survived being the former. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Because there is another event here um, in about four minutes, I think we'll forego the Q&A in this room. If you'd like to grab Adam immediately afterward in kind of the foyer area here with a pressing question, that's fine. He, he is headed down to the Maxwell Institute soon, so he doesn't have a lot of time. But uh, if you want to pose a question there, please feel free to do so. I'll just speak for all of us, Adam, by saying thank you so much for coming. This, his coming was uh, born out of uh, my selfishness in a way. I've wanted to hear his social scientific, as a scholar, hear his social scientific um, insights to my historical interests, and it was very stimulating. The, the unexpected payoff for me, and I'll speak as a Latter-day Saint, and that is for, a, for someone who is not a member of our faith to make such an investment in understanding it it's just a gift because you help us see ourselves more clearly. And that's a gift, Adam, and we're just, we're really grateful for your being here. So everyone, one more round of applause for Adam. Thank you for coming.